Would you like to be the president of the United States? I really don't believe I would, Rona, but I would like to see somebody as the president who could do the job, and there are very capable people in this country. Why wouldn't you dedicate yourself to public service? Because I think it's a very mean life. I, I would love and I would, I would dedicate my life to this country, but I see it as being a mean life, and I also see it as somebody with strong views and somebody with the kind of views that are maybe a little bit unpopular, which may be right, but may be unpopular, wouldn't necessarily have a chance of getting elected against somebody with no great brain but a big smile. This, this sounds like political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Probably not, but I, I do get tired of seeing the country ripped Why off. Why would you not? I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, nah, it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country. And if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally because I really am tired of seeing what's happening with this country, how we're, how we're really making other people live like kings, and we're not. You've said, though, that if you did run for president, you believe you'd win. Well, I don't know. I think I'd win. I tell you what, I wouldn't go in to lose. I've never gone in to lose in my <laughs> life. And, and if I did decide to do it, I think I'd be inclined. I, w I would say that I would have a hell of a chance of winning because I think people, I don't know how your audience feels, but I think people are tired of seeing the United States ripped off. And I can't promise you everything, but I can tell you one thing. This country would make one hell of a lot of money from those people that for 25 years have taken advantage. It wouldn't be the way it's been, believe me. But you might be classified as an Eastern Republican, fair? I guess you could say that, yes. Which means kind of a Rockefeller, Chase Manhattan Republican? I never thought of any of those terms. How do you I... define Are you a Bush Republican? No, I think I'm, I'm really, the people that I do best with are the people that drive the taxis. You know, wealthy people don't like me because I'm competing against them all the time and they don't <laughs> like me and I like to win. The fact is, I go down the streets of New York and the people that really like me are the taxi drivers and the workers, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I really get well, then why response. are you a Republican? I have no idea. I mean, I am a Republican because I just believe in certain principles of the Republican Party. You have flirted with the idea of politics. Now you're here at your first national convention. Does that get you interested in possibly making the plunge? Now you have to tell me something. Who told you I flirted? Well, I, mean, I didn't know that I flirted. Well, you took out full-page ads in the New York Times to talk about your foreign policy. No, Some people would say... Strongly. I do feel very strongly about the country. I love the country. You've become a role model in this country. The reason that your book sells, the reason that your board game sells, is because people are looking to leaders. People are looking for values. And you're one of the people, and it's no... You may dismiss it, but people are talking about, you know, Donald Trump for president. What they're really talking about is Donald Trump, show us the way. Well, Be the true white hat. I'm, again, somebody that has a good instinct financially. I have had historically. I've followed markets. I've been going the right direction, I, whether it's New York real estate or stocks or whatever. I know from a common sense financial standpoint that something has to burst when a country is losing billions and billions and billions of dollars a year and when other countries are making hundreds of billions of dollars something is going to burst and it's going to start here i know it it's a question of when to me it's not a question if it's a question of when and unless we're going to solve our problem and the problem is caused by our allies unless we're going to solve that problem this country is in very, very big trouble. And I'm not talking recession kind of trouble, I'm talking depression kind of trouble. Would you, would you really like to, to if, take over and run, and run the country as you have run your I would organization? Much, I would much prefer that somebody else do it. I just don't know if the somebody else is there. I don't know if we have the kind of advocate that you need. We need major surgery. This country needs major Are surgery. Are you the surgeon? I think I'd do a fantastic job, but I really would prefer not doing it. Uh-huh. Is, is, are you saying you will take it home if drafted? No, I'm not saying that. I'm uh -huh. saying that I hope that somebody comes along who can be an advocate, and I think that somebody will be so popular, he'll But you be, haven't seen anybody. He anybody. or she yeah. will be the most, but uh, I don't see it now. I wish that person were there. But again, I do know one thing. It's not a question. This country is losing hundreds of billions. It's not a question if, it's a question when. 
I have never understood how this is possible. I have never understood how somebody throughout this country didn't sue the United States government and have that overturned. I mean, you had people, investors, investing over a 10-year period for a set of, under a set of conditions, and this is, as I was talking before, playing the game. We're all playing by a certain set of rules. The rules were changed for the government, but they weren't changed for us. I mean, it was an incredible, it was an incredible circumstance that happened, and people went bust by the hundreds of thousands, and I, I hope you weren't one of them in terms of that, but obviously you know a lot of people that were. They changed the rules on taxes, and you have, I mean, you have some incredible situations where people guaranteed personally a stream of payments to be paid over a 10-year period based on a stream of tax benefits for perhaps a very good job, like a low-income housing development. Nothing wrong with that, a very positive thing. And after two years, they got wiped out with the taxes, and yet they still owed all of this money. And many of these people, most of these people, had to declare bankruptcy. They couldn't pay it. Candidate Donald Trump. Last Friday, he attended a fundraiser for Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura. They also held a joint news conference. So it looks like we're here to announce that Donald has been signed as the number one draft pick of the two. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, nobody talks about the soldiers that are coming back with no arms and no legs. And I saw at Mar-a-Lago on Mondays, I make Mar-a-Lago my club that you know about. In Palm Beach. I make that twice now. On a Monday, I let returning Iraqi injured soldiers come to the premises. The most beautiful people I've ever seen. But they're missing arms and legs. They're with their wives. Sometimes they're with their girlfriends. And the tears are coming down the faces of these people. Well, I, I just hate what's happened to this country. We've gone to a country that's no longer respected. We're in a war that we should have never, and by the way, I'm worse than any hawk there is in terms of military and in terms of defending ourselves. But Saddam Hussein didn't knock down the World Trade Center. He had nothing to do with it. And there were no weapons of mass destruction. The other day, the head of uh, 3M said that President Obama is anti-business. Do you get the same feeling that he does? Well, I don't know that it's anti-business or he just really doesn't know exactly uh, what to do. And I'm afraid it probably is the second thing. I don't see him necessarily as anti-business. I think that he is not sophisticated in the ways of business. He hasn't dealt with the people that you've dealt with and that I've dealt with. I deal with China as an example a lot. It is never easy. And I've made some very big deals with the Chinese. I've come out on top. I've come out in great shape. I sell apartments to Chinese people. I get along great with them. It's not like, you know, anti-China. I just think it's ridiculous that we allow them to do what they're doing to this country with the manipulation of the currency that you write about and understand and all of the other things that they do. And frankly, if I were them and if I could get away with it, I take my hat off to them, frankly. They, they do get away with it. And I hire companies all the time, and it's so hard for our companies to compete against Chinese countries. Companies. I mean, these, these companies have such an advantage, whether it's glass for a curtain wall or whether it's, and you use the term because you know what's happened, sheetrock. I mean, they used to give us sheetrock, just give it. And everybody that was unfortunate enough to use Chinese sheetrock had problems. I mean, problems like no, where people were dying from it. The good news, Steve, our product is much better, but with the manipulation of their currency, it's very, very, very hard for our companies to compete. But I'll certainly do whatever is necessary, and whatever, however I can help, whether they want me to make speeches, whether they want me to contribute, raise money, I'll do whatever I have to do. We need somebody great as a president. I know that you were mentioning that uh, Aaron and I did a kind of an interesting video uh, not that long ago in August about how things have fallen apart. But at that point, the only people who were saying it were uh, us and you. I was saying it. I was saying it a long time ago. And frankly, they're talking about 50 basis points. I think you should drop it a point, a full, solid 100 basis points, and just 
sit back and see. And I was actually looking at somebody, a gentleman from Goldman Sachs, was saying 175. Right. So that's going to be interesting. But I think that's ultimately going to be happy. And it would be nice if Ben could get now ahead of the curve right. instead of always being behind the curve. He's behind the curve. Say what you want about Alan Greenspan. He was always slightly ahead of the curve. Right. Right. And that was always brilliant. And he had this incredible reputation. I think Ben has to get a little bit ahead of the curve. He has to do something dramatic. And I really think what he should do is surprise the hell out of everyone and do it 100. And let's see what happens. That would be big. Any politician do you think has the pulse? Anyone running for president has the pulse of what you know about the economy? Well, the biggest problem is something I never hear about. I told you about it once. Every time they lower interest rates, the cartel, because I call it a cartel, right. the illegal monopoly raises oil prices, okay? So the monopoly, because that's all it is, right. it's a total illegal monopoly. If businesses ever formed OPEC, everybody would be put in jail. <laughs> Here they are, and every time, an oil, every time a country hits oil, they're invited in to the cartel, okay? It's a disgrace. So what happens is every time interest rates go down, oil prices go up, and it's the same number. I mean, practically the same money. So they lower it, they raise it, they lower it, they raise it. Now you have oil that's close to 100, going to be over 100. And nobody in this country calls and says, get that damn oil price down. You get it down. But I have to tell you that our country is in serious, serious trouble. We owe. 17 trillion dollars our debt how do you pay off 17 trillion nobody ever heard the expression a number of years ago the word trillion we have debt that's beyond belief we have deficits that nobody can even comprehend china which i've been talking about for the last five years yesterday right in our face they just devalued their currency. Now, for those that don't understand devaluation, what they're basically doing is saying, we're really ripping your big league. Nobody's ever done it better than us, but now we're gonna really do it again. And the reason they did it, and everybody was surprised by it, was because our leadership is so weak and so pathetic that they can get away with it. And Believe me, they're taking our jobs, and they're taking them big league. And China's not the only one. You look at other countries, they're all doing the same thing. They have no respect for our leader. And frankly, they have no respect any longer for our great country. And it's so simple to solve. What we need is a strong economy. What we need is jobs. Now, you hear these phony job numbers, 6.7%. The 6.7% is probably 21 or 22% real numbers. When you give up looking for a job, it's like they consider you employed. It's amazing. They changed this. You know, in the old days, if you had people that couldn't find work, they couldn't find work. Today, such a huge number. Now you look at what's going on with Afghanistan. You have Karzai that's treating our president like he doesn't even exist. So they make a deal, and I'm not advocating stay, because frankly, I want to build this country. I want to build these schools. I don't want to build a school in Afghanistan a road going to the school, watch it get built up and then blown up four times, and they keep rebuilding and rebuilding, and you go to Brooklyn, New York, and you can't have schools, you go to Iowa, you can't, you go to wherever you go, and you can't have schools, because we don't have any money, because we're spending it in other places, where frankly, they don't want us, and I don't want them, and it's amazing. Our country is in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. I beat China all the time. All the time.
When did we beat Japan at anything? They send their cars over by the millions. And what do we do? When was the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? It doesn't exist, folks. They beat us all the time. When do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. And now they're beating us economically. They are not our friend, believe me. But they're killing us economically. The U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. Islamic terrorism is eating up large portions of the Middle East. They become rich. I'm in competition with them. They just built a hotel in Syria. Can you believe this? They built a hotel. When I have to build a hotel, I pay interest. They don't have to pay interest because they took the oil that when we left Iraq, I said we should have taken. So now ISIS has the oil. And what they don't have, Iran has. And in 19, and I will tell you this, and I said it very strongly, years ago, I said, and I love the military, and I want to have the strongest military that we've ever had, and we need it more now than ever, but I said, don't hit Iraq because you're going to totally destabilize the Middle East. Iran is going to take over the Middle East. Iran and somebody else will get the oil. And it turned out that Iran is now taking over Iraq. Think of it. Iran is taking over Iraq. And they're taking it over big league. We spent $2 trillion in Iraq. $2 trillion. We lost thousands of lives thousands in Iraq. We have wounded soldiers who I love. I love. They're great. All over the place. Thousands and thousands of wounded soldiers. And we have nothing. We can't even go there. We have nothing. And every time we give Iraq equipment, the first time a bullet goes off in the air, they leave it. Last week I read 2,000 300 Humvees, these are big vehicles, were left behind for the enemy. 2,000, you would say maybe two, maybe four? 2,300 sophisticated vehicles, they ran and the enemy took them. You're right. Last quarter, it was just announced, our gross domestic product, a sign of strength, right? But not for us. It was below zero. Who ever heard of this? It's never below zero. Our labor participation rate was the worst since 1978. But think of it, GDP below zero. Horrible labor participation rate. And our real unemployment is anywhere from 18 to 20 percent. Don't believe the 5.6. Don't believe it. That's right. A lot of people up there can't get jobs. They can't get jobs because there are no jobs. Because China has our jobs and Mexico has our jobs. They all have our jobs. But the real number, the real number, is anywhere from 18 to 19 and maybe even 21 percent and nobody talks about it because it's a statistic that's full of nonsense our enemies are getting stronger and stronger by the day and we as a country are getting weaker even our nuclear arsenal does it work? It came out recently. They have equipment that's 30 years old. They don't even know if it worked. And I thought it was horrible when it was broadcast on television because, boy, does that send signals to Putin 
and all of the other people that look at us and they say, that is a group of people and that is a nation that truly has no clue. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. We have a disaster called the big lie, Obamacare. Obamacare. Yesterday it came out that costs are going for people up 29, 39, 49, and even 55 percent. And deductibles are through the roof. You have to get hit by a tractor, literally a tractor, to use it. Because the deductibles are so high, it's virtually useless. It is a disaster. And remember the $5 billion website. $5 billion we spent on a website. And to this day, it doesn't work. A $5 billion website. I have so many websites I have all over the place. I hire people. They do a website. It costs me $3. $5 billion website. I have so many websites I have all over the place. I hire people. They do a website. It costs me $3. $5 billion website. Well, you need somebody because politicians are all talk, no action. Nothing's going to get done. They will not bring us, believe me, to the promised land. They will not. As an example, I've been on the circuit making speeches, and I hear my fellow Republicans, and they're wonderful people. I like them. They all want me to support them. They don't know how to bring it about. They come up to my office. I, I'm meeting with three of them in the next week, and they don't know. Are you running? Are you not running? Could we have your support? What do we do? How do we do it? I like them. And I hear their speeches. And they don't talk jobs, and they don't talk China. When was the last time you heard, China's killing us? They're devaluing their currency to a level that you wouldn't believe it makes it impossible for our companies to compete. Impossible. They're killing us. But you don't hear that from anybody else. You don't hear it from anybody else. And I watch the speeches. <laughs> Thank you. I watch the speeches of these people, and they say, the sun will rise, the moon will set, all sorts of wonderful things will happen. Over and people are saying, what's going on? I just want a job. Just get me a job. I don't need the rhetoric. I want a job. And that's what's happening. And it's going to get worse, because remember, Obamacare really kicks in in 16. 2016, really big leg. It is going to be amazingly destructive. Doctors are quitting. I have a friend who's a doctor, and he said to me the other day, Donald, I never saw anything like it. I have more accountants than I have nurses. It's a disaster. My patients are beside themselves. They had a plan that was good. They have no plan now. We have to repeal Obamacare, and it can re be replaced. And, and it can be replaced with something much better for everybody. Let it be for everybody, but much better and much less expensive for people and for the government. And we can do it. So I've watched the politicians. I've dealt with them all my life. If you can't make a good deal with a politician, then there's something wrong with you. You're certainly not very good. And that's what we have representing us. They will never make America great again. They don't even have a chance. They're controlled fully. They're controlled fully by the lobbyists, by the donors, and by the special interests, fully. That's, they control them. Hey, I have lobbyists, I have to tell you. I have lobbyists that can produce anything for me. They're great. But you know what? It won't happen. 
it won't happen because we have to stop doing things for some people but for this country it's destroying our country we have to stop and it has to stop now now our country needs our country needs a truly great leader and we need a truly great leader now we need a leader that wrote the art of the deal we need a leader that can bring back our jobs can bring back our manufacturing can bring back our military can take care of our vets our vets have been abandoned and we also need a cheerleader you know when president obama was elected i said well the one thing i think he'll do well i think he'll be a great cheerleader for the country i think he'd be a great spirit he was vibrant he was young. i really thought that he would be a great cheerleader he's not a leader that's true you're right about that but he wasn't a cheerleader he's actually a negative force he's been a negative force he wasn't a cheerleader he was the opposite we need somebody that can take the brand of the United States and make it great again. It's not great again. We need, we need somebody, we need somebody that literally will take this country and make it great again. We can do that, and I will tell you, I love my life. I have a wonderful family. They're saying, Dad, you're going to do something that's going to be so tough. You know, all of my life I've heard that a truly successful person, a really, really successful person, and even modestly successful, cannot run for public office. It just can't happen. And yet that's the kind of mindset that you need to make this country great again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. I could not be more proud tonight to present to you and to all of America my father and our next president, Donald J. Trump. believed that when we started this journey on June 16th last year, we, and I say we, because we are a team, would have received almost 14 million votes, the most in the history of the Republican Party. Who would have believed this? Who would have believed this? Friends, delegates, and fellow Americans, I humbly and gratefully accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States.
It is my high honor and distinct privilege to introduce to you the President-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. To you, the President-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. As I've said from the beginning, ours was not a campaign, but rather an incredible and great movement made up of millions of hardworking men and women who love their country and want a better, brighter future for themselves and for their family. It's a movement comprised of Americans from all races, religions, backgrounds, and beliefs who want and expect our government to serve the people and serve the people it will. <laughs> Working together, we will begin the urgent task of rebuilding our nation and renewing the American dream. I've spent my entire life in business looking at the untapped potential in projects and in people all over the world. That is now what I want to do for our country. <laughs> Tremendous potential. We're going to get to work immediately for the American people. Again, it's my honor. It was an amazing evening. It's been an amazing two-year period. And I love this. To you, the President-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. As I've said from the beginning, ours was not a campaign, but rather an incredible and great movement made up of millions of hardworking men and women who love their country and want a better, brighter future for themselves and for their family. It's a movement comprised of Americans from all races, religions, backgrounds, and beliefs who want and expect our government to serve the people and serve the people it will. <laughs> Working together, we will begin the urgent task of rebuilding our nation and renewing the American dream. I've spent my entire life in business looking at the untapped potential in projects and in people all over the world. That is now what I want to do for our country. <laughs> Tremendous potential. We're going to get to work immediately for the American people. Again, it's my honor. 
It was an amazing evening. It's been an amazing two-year period. And I love this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Every four years, we gather on these steps to carry out the orderly and peaceful transfer of power. Today's ceremony, however, has very special meaning, because today we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. January 20th, 2017, will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. Everyone is listening to you now. You came by the tens of millions to become part of a historic movement, the likes of which the world has never seen before. At the center of this movement, is a crucial conviction that a nation exists to serve its citizens. Americans want great schools for their children, safe neighborhoods for their families, and good jobs for themselves. These are just and reasonable demands of righteous people and a righteous public. The oath of office I take today is an oath of allegiance to all Americans. We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. I will fight for you with every breath in my body, and I will never ever let you down. America will start winning again, winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth. And we will bring back our dreams. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example. We will shine for everyone to follow. At the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. The Bible tells us 
How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, but always pursue solidarity. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it cannot be done. No challenge can match the heart and fight and spirit of America. We will not fail. Our country will thrive and prosper again. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. Whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. We all enjoy the same glorious freedoms, and we all salute the same great American flag. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. I will tell you, I love my life. I have a wonderful family. They're saying, Dad, you're going to do something that's going to be so tough. You know, all of my life I've heard that a truly successful person cannot run for public office. Just can't happen. And yet that's the kind of mindset that you need to make this country great again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States. And we are going to make our country great again.